Like everyone else, you were born into bondage. Born into a prison for your mind. Buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy, because Kansas is going bye-bye. You'll want to remember this moment as the last time you thought the flat earth was stupid. Hello everyone, this is ODD, and yes, I'm finally admitting that even though I don't like labels, I'm a flat earther. Based on my research for the past 10 months, our world is very different from the model that we are being taught by the authority on the matter. It took me a while to come to terms with this, and it took even longer to gain the courage to talk about it. It can be pretty embarrassing to go against popular opinion, but this is real. It's not a psyop, it's not a distraction, and it's not a bandwagon. It's a reasonable debate. It's thousands of people taking what we've been told and comparing it to what we see and experience, only to find out that they do not match up. Once you start digging into this, it becomes clear that there is no evidence for the speculated spinning ball that we supposedly live on, and everything points to a flat earth. The flat earth is much more than just reasonable. The one and only reason that it's reasonable to argue against the flat earth is that we've all been taught otherwise our whole lives. We blindly believe something that A, has never been proven, and B, is pretty much fucking impossible. Thanks to people like Eric Dubay, the Flat Earth has re-emerged and it has more steam than ever. Before I've ever even entertained the Flat Earth, I knew not to trust the space programs of the world. Close examinations of NASA and other space programs reveal that things aren't what they seem and that we, the people, are being lied to. We have no real pictures of the Earth, and no matter how hard we try, we just can't find the curvature. Not only that, but flight paths make more sense on a flat map, and large bodies of water not being able to curve into a giant ball completely resonates. Forensically speaking, the globe model is so very unlikely that any good detective wouldn't believe a fucking word the globe says. The globe's story is so full of circumstantial, impossible coincidences, which only prove the globe is a fucking liar. We'll be going over that in this video as well as other reasons why the world isn't what we're led to believe. I appreciate you tuning in. Let's get started. Our daily observations of the earth are consistent with a flat and stationary surface. Most if not all ancient civilizations knew that the earth was flat. The people of today would say that ancient cultures were ignorant and unaware, yet they accomplished great feats that we still can't accomplish to this day. The truth is that they had real knowledge, and some of us only have an education. But what is an education? Education is when you are told what to think and how to think. Those that are able to remember and regurgitate what they've been told on command are considered well-educated. But there is a big difference between being educated and being intelligent. Just because you believe what you've been told doesn't make it true. In fact, the flat versus spherical earth is a debate that has never really died. It's been raging for centuries. It was a huge argument as recently as the early and mid 1900s, but with programs like NASA, founded in 1958, the latter half of the 20th century was a win for the spherical Earth. It wasn't a question for the average person anymore. Though at the time the shape of the Earth was still up to be proven, NASA claims that they went to the moon and captured a shot of the spherical Earth as if they always knew it was indeed spherical. Those of you who think this technical difficulty was planned and think I'm scamming you, go do it for yourself. Because <laughs> you're going to find the exact same thing. I got nothing to hide here. This is live on the air, okay? I'm going to zoom in on the Earth in Photoshop. Can you see the Earth? To image, adjust, levels. And I'm going to bring the levels over here. And I'm going to bring the levels up. Uh oh. What is that? Why is there a square box? around the Earth, allegedly taken from the scientists on the moon in Apollo 17. And people wonder why I don't trust NASA. That's why I don't trust NASA. I mean, they're always out there saying, you know, Rob, you, everybody's trying to show you stuff from space and you, won't, you keep rejecting it. This is why I reject it. These guys are liars. 
you know? What are some of the basic observations someone can make to ascertain that the Earth is neither a globe or spinning? We've been taught that we're on a ball spinning around the sun. And so to hear that you might be on a flat plane, uh, motionless at the center of the universe with all the celestial bodies spinning around you, just as it appears, actually comes as a surprise. But it shouldn't, because our eyes, experience, and common sense all tell us that the horizon is perfectly flat, and we feel motionless. We don't hear ourselves whizzing by at thousands of miles per hour. No matter how high amateur rockets or balloons have gone up, the horizon rises to the eye of the observer all the way up, and that's only consistent with a flat plane. Their theory just gets more and more wild as time has gone on. And so, yeah, it began with the spinning Earth going a thousand miles per hour, which is then circling around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour, which then they decided the sun was, it wasn't a heliocentric model, but more of an eccentric model where they don't know where the center is and we're just exploding out of a big bang. So the, uh, the sun, uh, we're, we're spinning around the sun and then the sun and us are spinning around the Milky Way galaxy, they say, at 500,000 miles per hour. And then the entire Milky Way galaxy, they say, is shooting off from the Big Bang at 670 million miles per hour, almost the speed of light. Uh, so there's at least four uh, rip-raging, contradictory motions supposedly going at all times, yet you don't experience uh, any of it, nor can you measure any of it using the stars. The flat motionless Earth is, not only is it the greatest conspiracy of all, it's also the easiest to prove. I mean, it, it just is flat and motionless, just as it appears. Look into it more and more, make it, make it a, a thing to try and debunk it, if you will. You know, even if you want to do it that way. Negative reinforcement works too. Try as you will, you're only going to find proofs for the flat motionless Earth you're not going to confirm that you're on a spinning ball. The curvature of the Earth eludes us. Either the Earth is much larger in circumference than we are told, or the curve just doesn't exist. People assume that there is a curve, but it's never really been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Cameras with fisheye lenses, Hollywood movies, and NASA CGI are the closest we get to seeing curvature. The deception and the lies are just so pervasive and they're just so deep that I, I swear it gives me a headache. The surface of water is always level. This is just natural physics. We know this, that water, uh, if unobstructed and uncontained, will flow outwards. Uh, finding it the easiest course to maintain its own level, right? So, uh, but the ball earth model claims that the oceans are huge, 100 mile walls of curved water curving around the ball. That's ridiculous. They say that gravity makes it this possible, but you don't see that. You go right. to the beach, you see a completely flat horizon, you see water just ever so gently uh, coming up on the shore. So there's the pretty blue marble that NASA claims we are living on with circumference of 24,901 and 3959 radius. So to find the curvature, you take 8 inches times your distance squared. That's 8 inches times your distance squared, and if you don't square the distance, you end up with this, and this is not what NASA has shown us. They have given us a beautiful blue marble that we love. So, so you get 8 inches for 1 mile, 32 inches in 2 miles, 16.6 .6 feet with 5 miles, so on and so forth. So what I did is I shot this pier, which is in Daytona Beach, Florida. And as you can see, between the water and the walkway of the pier is about 12 to 16 feet based on the height of the people and the railing. So I started at... Um, Granada, which is 4.92 miles away, and I shot this, and based on that distance and the formula, there should be 16 feet of curvature, but obviously you can still see the entire gap under the, um, the walkway there between that and the water. So in addition to that, behind that pier is actually a lighthouse, which you can see 
uh, right above the pier, you can see the light. That is 16 miles away from my location. And I shot that lighthouse. Now that lighthouse is 175 feet tall, and the curvature from 16 miles away should be 170 feet. You can clearly see about the entire lighthouse uh, beyond that pier. So like I said, there should be 170 feet of curvature, but there's none. And those hotels there are even further. Those are in New Smyrna, which is 20 miles. If NASA is right, and there is, and we do live on a ball, they're going to have to make up that curvature. If it's not in the 20 miles I'm shooting, well then that means it's got to be made up further on down the line. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say we live on this ball and then say, oh, you can't detect the curvature. Well, you got to detect it somewhere because if it's not dropping here, it's going to have to drop even more down the lines in order to make that circle, that ball they say we live on. And it's pretty round. That blue marble they give us is perfectly round. Lighthouses are one great example. The Isle of Wight Lighthouse in England, it's 180 feet high and can be seen up to 42 miles away, a distance at which modern astronomers say the light should fall 996 feet below the line of sight. Why can you still see it? Another one worth mentioning that people be familiar with is the Statue of Liberty. It stands 326 feet above sea level and on a clear day can be seen as far as 60 miles away. Now if the Earth was a globe at the dimensions that they give us, that would put Lady Liberty at an impossible 2,074 feet below the horizon. No, not one picture of the Earth. Imagine that. 2016, and we still don't have a picture of our home. Thousands of satellites supposedly orbiting the Earth. Why can't we get thousands of pictures? One shot with the whole Earth in it. Hell, we should have a channel on cable that shows the Earth rotating 24 hours a day, every day. Nope. Let's listen to NASA's very own Robert Simmon talk about how we get our fake pictures of Earth. In 1972, we saw our home in a new way. Apollo 17 astronauts snapped this picture. It gave people the first look at their home planet as a single entity. Last week, scientists at NASA released this. The shot is compiled from data from NASA's VIRS instrument, which orbits the Earth about every 100 minutes, taking measurements of light coming off the planet. That can be translated into ribbons of imagery like this, and then into one of these. And this is just the latest in NASA's Earth from Space album, which may be one of the most mind-expanding collections of images in human history. Then in 2002, Blue Marble 2.0, NASA's Rob Simmon made this. Simmons' job is... It's primarily taking data and making pictures out of it. That's what this is, a composite of data sets from several different instruments translated into a picture. So we actually had to take clouds out. They stashed the clouds for later, went onto the ocean. That came from an instrument that measures phytoplankton in the sea. Where it was low, I colored it dark blue because they're low mostly in mid-oceans. And then where it was a little bit higher, it was like a little bit brighter green. Then add the clouds back in. There's a small problem with it because there's a very slight gap in between each orbit. So some of those are painted on. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. Then? There was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat, or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just take Command Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. What I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space. But I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm allergic to bullshit. Not having one authentic picture of the earth alone is a huge red flag. Christoph, let me ask you. 
why do you think that uh, Truman has never come close to discovering the true nature of his world until now? We accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. The Flat Earth model is a working model. It's by no means definitive due to the nature of this massive cover-up. For the past 500 years, we've been completely buying into the Copernicus heliocentric model, but what we do know about the Flat Earth is based on the azimuthal equidistant map that seems to be working out. This map goes as far back as the year 1000 and possibly earlier, now used as an official map by the US Geological Survey and also as the official logo for the United Nations. Is this our real home being hidden from us in plain sight? I think it is. The first thing a lot of people say is, where's the edge? Well, look at this map where Antarctica is a 360 degree ice barrier that holds the water in. These ice walls are real and they stand 150 feet above the surface of the water. Then you need to understand that there is no independent access to Antarctica. Average people can only go there on a guided tour. It has no towns, no cities, and no permanent residences. What's past the 150-foot ice wall is anyone's guess. How far the ice extends, how it terminates, and what exists beyond it. The Antarctic Treaty, signed in 1959 by 12 nations and more later on, states that Antarctica is for peaceful purposes only. No military activities, just scientific research and government exploration. Expeditions by any party must be discussed in advance. It's the longest and most successful treaty between nations. The treaty also states that there are ships, stations, and equipment to ensure compliance of the treaty. Sounds like military activity to me. Anyway, so this azimuthal equidistant map appears to be correct for the most part. Over the centuries, there's been other maps that look pretty close to it as well. Let's look at an interesting story that was recently in the news that supports this flat map. A woman gave birth on a flight from Bali to Los Angeles, so the flight made an emergency landing in Alaska. Here's what it would look like on a globe. Now, here's what it would look like on a flat earth. Which one makes more sense? Exactly. A big issue I was having with the flat earth for the longest time was the sunrise and sunsets. I realized that it was a perspective issue. First, you must understand that the sun is not 93 million miles away. If it was, we would never see anything like this here. This is concentrated because it's closer. It's much more probable that the sun is only a few thousand miles away and that it's the same size as the moon. Once you comprehend this, all of the sudden, solar eclipses make sense. Holy fucking shit! Something that makes sense! Okay, so the sun is close, which gives it the ability to spotlight the area that it's over, and when it leaves your view, due to perspective, it takes the light with it. There is a generous amount of light where the sun is at, but since it's so close, it doesn't spread its light like it would if it were bigger and further. The sun circumnavigates the earth like a huge clockwork. Sometimes that takes a while to sink in. Alright, let's talk about the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect states that when a moving object leaves the ground, the earth continues to rotate meaning that when shooting a gun at a certain distance, the bullet would be a little off due to the Earth's rotation. If that's the case, then airplanes would have to account for the Coriolis effect, but they don't. This is only a few things that work better on a flat, motionless Earth. Do you need a hundred excuses as to why you're not feeling any motion or seeing any curvature? Are those excuses easier to believe? Or is it easier to use Occam's razor and go with what our senses are telling us? The Earth is flat and not spinning. Now, real quick, let's kind of just uh, explain the Coriolis effect in layman's terms. Uh, the Coriolis effect is the effect that when the bullet leaves the barrel of the gun, it is actually leaving the surface of the Earth. So as the bullet leaves the, the barrel of the gun, the Earth is still rotating. 
and the bullet is not rotating with the earth. So the earth will actually rotate out from underneath of the bullet while it is in flight. This one is a touchy subject. Uh, this whole fucking video is a touchy subject. So anyway, this one, this one's hard to get across to people big time. But outer space is up for debate. Space programs are compartmentalized, and most astronauts are Freemasons that have to swear an oath of secrecy when dealing with the so-called missions. The thing is that there is so much footage of NASA and other space agencies making mistakes. Sometimes we could see bubbles in the spacewalks. Sometimes we could see harnesses and wires on the people in the International Space Station. The permed hair that moves nothing like it would in zero gravity. These are huge red flags. Not to mention the Van Allen radiation belt. The Van Allen radiation belt is a layer of energetic charged particles that is held in place around a magnetized planet such as Earth by the planet's magnetic field. Sounds kind of like a dome if there is one. Oddly enough, one of NASA's employees admitted that this radiation belt needs to be figured out before humans could pass through it. Listen closely. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. Let's talk about satellites. We've already discussed how there are no pictures of the Earth, so are satellites even real? Not likely. Ground towers are built all over the world and are more than adequate to relay our television, radio, and cell phone service. All GPS is done through uh, land-based towers and things like Google Earth are taken with high altitude planes and most of them are just done with cars on, on uh, street level. Did you know that satellites were actually invented by Arthur C. Clarke? the science fiction author. I didn't <laughs> they, know that. <laughs> they, they shortly became science fact uh, after that. They, he, yeah, the geostationary satellite, look it up. It was created by a science fiction author. And then within a decade, NASA claims to have sent a real one up there. And ever since then, that's where we get all our communications from. So if satellites were real, we would constantly hear stories of them being hit by meteors or comets, and that doesn't happen. Uh, no one's ever lost their direct TV feed during the Perseids meteor shower because one of the meteors knocked out one of the satellites. It doesn't happen, it's never happened, and it won't happen. And that to me tells me there is no satellites. You would constantly be worried about them and you would constantly hear about them having something happen. And it's so rare that you hear that. So you may or may not have heard the term cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is when new information challenges your beliefs and you just can't let go. It's just like that scene in The Matrix. 
No. I don't believe it. It's not possible. Stop. Let me out. Let me out. I want out. We have a rule. We never free a mind once it's reached a certain age. It's not easy going through this kind of deception and then realizing that your whole life was spent thinking and believing one thing when it's the opposite. Nobody wants to feel like they've been fooled, like they've been had. I'm a human just like you and I never would have thought in my wildest dreams that I'd be on this kind of journey. This journey of realization and reckoning. This journey of putting everything I know to the side so I can absorb information that seems ridiculous yet so sensible. It's time to say fuck it. It's not your fault that you were wrong. It's not your fault that you fell for a trick that the whole world also fell for. I'm right here with you. It's time to take down your mental barrier and recognize that we have a lot of work to do in order to find out what this place really is and why we're here. It's not to be slaves of the dollar. It's not to be slaves of the clock. Our reality is being manipulated and hidden from us. Please wake up and try to awaken those around you. So how did this happen? Okay, let's start in the classroom. The first time anybody enters a school classroom, they are introduced to the globe model of the Earth. This three-dimensional scale model of the Earth that has never been proven was invented in the 1400s. Fast forward to 1927, a big budget movie company called Universal Pictures came out with its movie intro and guess what? The spinning ball Earth still hasn't been proven. This is 30 years before NASA was founded. Over the years, Universal kept coming out with similar logo intros, and to this day, we see the spinning ball Earth before many of the movies that we watch. Besides, there are countless movies about outer space that use the same model. We have been indoctrinated, and it's as simple as that. For the spherical Earth to remain unproven after this long is a wake-up call to everybody that lives here. We need to shed this programming right here, right now, and find out what the fuck is going on. No more embracing this sick illusion that was created by psychopaths. I'm going to keep searching for answers and trying to make something happen. All I want to know is, who's coming with me? I like to be an explorer, like the great Magellan. Oh, well, you're too late. There's really nothing left to explore. Right before your surgery, I asked if you had packed your cell phone, and you said, which one? When? Skylar, I was medicated. I mean, I, I, I could have said the world was flat. You know what I think? I think you accidentally told the truth. The world was flat. You know what I think? You accidentally told the truth. The world was flat. You know what I think? You
really the evidence shows me that it's flat and stationary. There is much more evidence uh, based on uh, uh, just pure analysis that it's flat and stationary. So it's not actually a sphere, it's an it's oblate. And officially it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby is a good way. It's like pear shaped. Yeah. Really, we're in big trouble as far as lack of critical thinking and lack of free thinking. We are really are in big, big trouble. We need to step it up as far as the awakening goes. You really need to put your thinking cap on and you really start to really need to start to look at these things and look at them with a critical eye and with a critical mind.